E two zero no E E two two one one. Oh, I used to teach that. I used to teach that. I don't know whether now they distribute my book to you or not. I wrote a book for that. Maybe they don't like my book. Maybe they find it useless. Oh, my notes, eh? Oh, oh, they put my notes there. Yeah. How does it look like?
Jay is not here. All right, why don't we get started? Can the people in Zoom hear me? Come on, say something. All right. Okay, so today we are going to resume our discussion on discrete random variables. We are actually coming to the end of this chapter. We will finish this chapter on Thursday. And I think Thursday, we wouldn't need the full two hours. So I will actually do some examples. But today, we are still in the process of trying to understand uh, discrete random variables, and in particular, multiple discrete random variables. So there are two of them, maybe even more. So there are only two topics left to cover, which is conditioning and independence, all right? So last time, just as a recap, we looked at uh, discrete random variables, and there are two of them, okay? Let's say there are x and y, these are discrete random variables. What this means is that x takes on values in a finite set, okay, say x takes on values in 0, 1, that's an eg, 2, and y takes on values, say, in 0, 1, all the way to 7. So they are all only taking on values in some finite set, so we call them discrete random variables, okay? That is enough for us in this course, all right? So now once you have two random variables, uh, it will be interesting if they are actually uh, correlated in the sense that if you tell me something about Y, I would know something about X. For example, if Oliver and I are brothers and he, Oliver is very tall, so X is the height of Oliver, then by genetics, I would also be pretty tall. Right, so x and y, he's x, his height is x, my height is y, will be correlated in some way. Okay, so however, if we are not brothers, then x and y could be independent. All right, so we want to try to quantify this very carefully. So that gives us the notion of, you know, for a pair of correlated random variables, and you can think of correlation uh, in a very informal way at this point in time. We're going to talk about it in much more detail. But here we can form the joint TMF, probability mass function, okay? So this is written in this shorthand form as follows. Where note that the here, or everything here are uppercase. Here, these are lowercase. And this is shorthand for probability that X is equal to X and Y is equal to Y. So this comma here really means intersection or N, but usually we don't write this, right? Comma means N. Right. So now, once you have this joint probability mass function, that gives you a lot of information. You will be able to get the marginal probability mass functions from the joint. How do you do that? You marginalize out. So this operation here is called, this operation is called marginalization. I think the book doesn't use it, but a lot of books use it. Okay. These are called marginalization operations. It means that we take away one variable. We don't want y. We only want X, so we sum over all values of Y, okay? And this actually comes from the law of total probability or the total probability theorem that we saw in chapter one. And I'm going to examine the quiz, okay? So we, at the end of last lecture, also looked at expectation of functions of random variables. So if you are given a random variable, you can create a new one. For example, if X and Y are the heights of Oliver and myself, GXY could be the minimum height of the two of us. So G, X, Y could be the minimum of X and Y. And we can call that random variable, a new random variable Z. Or it could be the sum, okay? So this is a, these are all nice functions. 
So this is a function of two random variables. And we can naturally ask, what is the expectation of this new random variable? As I mentioned last time, there are two ways of doing this. And I, here I write down one way, okay? One of the ways, the long-winded way, is to compute the probability mass function of Z. After you compute the probability mass function of Z and you are successful, then you compute the expectation value of Z through the usual formula like this, okay? But this is long-winded because trying to get a handle on the probability mass function of Z is usually very cumbersome. Hence, there's a simpler way, and that is just to plug the function here and put the joint probability mass function here and, and sum this up over the x, y values, all right? One of the consequences of this is this very important result known as the linearity of expectation. Here we have two random variables and we have three fixed scalars. These are non-random scalars. Yeah, they are just scalars, okay? So you could take this as two, three, seven. It's just any numbers, okay? And the expectation of this linear combination or affine combination, if you wish, is equal to this uh, very natural expansion here, okay? So this is nothing surprising and this is a recap from last time. Okay, so are there any questions at this point in time? Okay, if you can just interrupt me at any point in time, huh? because we are doing very well on time. So today is a one hour lecture. So I want to just go through one small topic and maybe we will illustrate with lots of examples next time. Okay, but today we will talk about conditioning. All right, so again, we have x, y, fix a discrete random variables, two of them, okay? And now we want to try to understand, suppose, all right, x and y are correlated. So if you know x, you know something about y. You know y, you know something about x. For example, x and y could be, x could be my travel time to NUS today. And y could be the weather, all right? So if it is very rainy, right, then my travel time to NUS will be long because I may be stuck in a jam, okay? So we are interested in the following, okay? We are interested in um, always conditioning on a particular random variable or an event. But at this point in time, let us say that A is a particular event with the probability of A being bigger than zero because we, we are going to divide by probability of A shortly. So we are trying to understand now the conditional PMF, the conditional probability mass function of a particular random variable, discrete random variable, X condition or given knowledge of an event. What is this notion? Okay. So this is denoted by this P of X given A. Note that A is an event. It is not a random variable, even though it is capital. But as I mentioned, right, all our random variables in this class are at the back of the alphabet, X, Y, Z. All right, so A is not at the back of the alphabet. It is not a random variable. Okay, that is our convention in this class. So this is the following definition of the conditional probability mass function of X given A. It is exactly this definition. So we condition ourselves on this particular event A. And now by base rule, this is nothing but the probability of the event that X equals to X intersect A by base rule divided by P of A, all right? Now this can be written in an alternative form by using the total probability theorem in the denominator, okay? So this is the intersection. We can divide this by the sum over all possible elements, X prime probability of X equals to X prime intersect with A. So the bottom here is just nothing but the application of the law of total probability. And this is true because this forms a partition of the sample space, all right? So the last equality holds by the, by the, I think in this book it's called total probability theorem. And the fact that X equals to X prime for all X prime, you can write X if you wish, uh, forms a partition of the sample space. And I already mentioned what is a partition of the sample space omega. All right, so now just a few remarks. So now you have this new PMF, 
right? This new PMF, the only difference is that you're conditioning on A, okay? The remark is that the conditional PMF, PMF stands for, again, probability mass function, P of X given A of X is a PMF, okay? That's why we give it a name, P, conditional PMF. All right. So by the fact that it is a PMF, it must satisfy a few properties. So P of X given A, X must be greater than zero or greater than zero, good zero for all X. And furthermore, the sum over all possible values of X, this must be equal to one. All right. So now I condition on A, the properties of the PMF properties do not change. All right. Now, all this is very abstract. As with all other theory that we, we learn in this class, we must supplement our theory with examples, okay? So I want to illustrate to you a few examples of conditional PMFs, okay? So the first example is an easy one. The second is not so easy. So let X be the outcome of uh, the role of a fair six-sided dice. Okay, so of course, X can take on values one, two, up to six. And the unconditional or the marginal PMF is one over six for X running from uh, one to six and zero otherwise. So that is the unconditional PMF. But suppose, right, Oliver came to tell me that, well, he rolled the dice and he saw it, but he didn't tell me. But he told me some side information. He said that actually the roll, the outcome is even. Uh -huh. So he told me this. He didn't tell me the exact number, but he only told me this. Then how does that change my belief about this coin, about this dice? How does it change my belief about the random outcome of this fair six-sided dice? Now, clearly, right, if Oliver is not lying, then I know that X cannot be one, three, five. So what is true is that the probability, I'm interested in the probability of X condition on knowledge of this event. But let me just, before uh, using intuition, let me use the formula that I prescribed above here, okay? So what is this? All right, so we use base rule and maybe I use K here because it's an integer. Let me change to K, okay, sorry about that. All right, so this is P probability of X equals to K intersect with A divided by probability of A. Okay, now what is the probability of A? Perhaps the denominator is easy to deal with. Uh, yes, you can say that A is a new sample space. Yeah, David is correct. So can someone give me the uh, answer to probability of A? It's a number. What is the chance that the row is even. Uh, Sean. Oh, I didn't even, uh, Sean is not even here, but he answered. Very good. So it's half, three over six. Let me put three over six here. Thank you very much. Okay. So now we have to now deal with the top. Now the top is not so easy. Okay. Now the top actually, the, the numerator here actually requires some thinking. Okay. So maybe I will readjust this a little and let me just put the probability of A here to be three over six, which is one over two, okay? Now, let, let us now do the above carefully and slowly. So the probability that X equals to K together with A, which is the toss is even. Now, if K is odd, right? If K is odd, what is the chance of this happening? So you have an odd number here and even here. So what's the chance that the outcome is both odd and even? What's the chance that the outcome of a dice throw is both odd and even? Zero, exactly, thank you very much. There's no number that's odd and even, okay? But if this is, see, K is even, right? What can you say here? Well, this is the number is even. So this is also number even. So this reduces to nothing but the probability that X is equal to K, right? In a sense, right? The event X equals to K is a subset of the event A. 
So the intersection of these two, right? The intersection of these two guys here is actually this guy. This is the intersection. So you know, if you have B intersect A and B is a subset of A, then the probability of B intersect A is the probability of B. So we can drop the A here. Do you agree? Because if you know that X is equal to K and K is even, well, certainly the outcome is even. So you can drop this. Understand? This is the crucial part. Any questions? This is really the crucial part. So now this is nothing but the probability that X equals to K, which is nothing but one over six. Okay, for k even. And k odd means 1, 3, 5, even means 2, 4, 6. Okay, so now combining everything together here, p of x given a, well, you take the top, which is say k odd here first, is 0. All right, now if k is even, so there are two choices here, you get 1 over 6 divided by 1 over 2, which is nothing but 1 over 3. Okay. So originally, the picture is as follows, okay? The picture is as follows. At the very beginning, before Oliver told us that the outcome is even, our belief was the following. Maybe I make this lower. Our belief of each of the outcomes was like this. Okay, that was at the very beginning. But after Oliver told us that the toss is even, right? The, the outcome is even. P of x given a. Well, then it cannot be odd anymore, so I need to get rid of all these odd ones. But now I already told you that the, the conditional PMF is a PMF. So if I remain at 1, 6, it's not going to give me a PMF since I'm 1, 6 times 3 is not going to be equal to 1. Right? So I basically need to rescale. So I basically need to make all this taller. Okay, and that's the effect of dividing by half that is multiplying by two. So I'm making all these guys taller. That is the meaning of conditioning on a particular event, such that this is up to one third. Does that make sense? Can you see my action here? That was the original. And then we are rescaling to make things taller. And the reason why it makes things taller is actually Oliver told us that the outcome is an A, is, is even, okay? So those parts, those uh, stumps here at one, three, and five, they cannot happen. So what can only happen is here, here, here. But you need to rescale so that this guy is a probability mass function. So if you sum over K even of P of X given A, X, uh, this should be K, you get exactly one. So this is a probability mass function. This is what is happening. Everyone understand? So you need to rescale when you um, condition. So does that mean that knowing A happened adds no new info? No, it, it depends on uh, what you mean by that. Actually, it does add info. It does add info that uh, you, you, know, you know that the, the toss is even, okay? But it does not change your belief about these points here. It is still uniform. Your belief about these points, these odd points, is uniform. So, David, do you understand? It does not change your belief about the bias of one of two, four, six. Okay, good. So, uh, maybe in the interest of time, I will skip this uh, other example because it's essentially the same. But maybe if we have time towards the end, I will go through this. But all I want to go through is the conditioning of one random variable on another. Okay. So here we talked about conditioning on a particular event. Now I want to talk about conditioning uh, one random variable on another random variable. Okay, so now we have x, y. These are two discrete random variables. Okay, uh, associated with the same experiment. Maybe you can say that. So they belong to the same sample space, but never mind. That's not important. Omega. Okay, this last part, not so important. So if we know 
that y is equal to y, this actually provides us with some information about x. Okay, so for example, if y, as I mentioned, is Oliver's height, then I know that Oliver is tall and we are brothers, then this will mean that I'm also likely to be tall. So x and y are correlated. So now let us define the conditional PMF of x given y. So in contrast to the above, where we talk about the conditional PMF of x given an event, this is a random variable, not an event. This is a random variable. So there are two types of conditioning that we are studying. Conditioning on an event and conditioning on a random variable. Okay, so this is the conditional PMF of a random variable given another random variable. And this is written as follows, P of X given Y, X given Y. Note, contrast this to the above, which is conditional on an on a event A, right? Then the, that's the, the notation here, in, there's no conditioning on something else, all right? But here we have X and Y, X and Y like this. That's because we are conditioning X on the event that Y is equal to Y. This will be made clear in a moment. This is defined to be the probability that X is equal to X given Y is equal to Y. So the event that we are conditioning on is Y equals to Y, all right? Uh, we will see some examples shortly. So this is the probability that X equals to X comma Y equals to Y divided by probability of Y equals to Y. Now, just as the above, we can use base rule to write this as the joint. This is called the joint divided by using the total probability theorem. We can sum up over X prime of X equals to X prime uh, Y. Uh, this, my notes are wrong. So Y equals to Y. Okay. So that is just, this step is just the, total probability theorem as we did before. So everything that we have done here, all we have done here is as before, is as above with the event A set to be the event Y equals to Y. Okay, so everything is the same. If you take Y equals to Y to be the big A here, all right, then this is A here, this is A here. You recover our discussion at the very beginning of this lecture. But here we introduce a new notation of X given Y and the event A is event Y equals to Y that is captured by this symbol and this symbol here, okay? Now, just now we said that for this uh, conditional probability mass function con condition event, we have that the conditional PMF is a usual PMF. Similarly here, clearly for all conditioning Y, this is a PMF, right? P of X given Y, X given Y is a probability mass function, okay? So what does this mean? It means that, well, your probability mass function ought to be non-negative everywhere. So this must hold for all X for all X. And at the same time, if you sum up over all possible values of X, you get this, you get equal to one. So as I mentioned, all this is parallel to the case when we talk about conditioning on an event A, except now the event is this very special event A equals to Y equals to Y, all right? So now at this point, you would notice that uh, from this particular relation here, the conditional PMF is equal to this base rule, all right? That you can write the joint P of XY, X comma Y as the conditional multiplied by the marginal, all right? So this, not, this comes from just this equation here, okay? This one here being equal to this. So we notice that this is nothing but the joint PMF. So this can be written as the joint divided by the marginal, use the conditional, all right? So basically the joint here is equal to the conditional multiplied by the marginal always, okay? So that is a rule that all of us have to remember. 
And you can rewrite this in yet another way. You can flip it around. You can have P of Y given X, Y given X, P of X of X. So again, the same interpretation holds that this is the conditional and you have marginal. Okay. So, but these are two different marginals. One is the X marginal and one is the Y marginal. Okay. Right. So this... This relation, this equality here comes about because we are multiplying this to the side. Okay, so I'm not going to write this down. So this is the notion of conditional PMF of one x give, of one random variable given another random variable. Okay, so it is very useful. At least when I learned this, the professor, this the professor who taught me this, drew this picture, and this picture really drew, really drilled home. The, the, the idea of what is a conditional PMF, because this sounds very abstract the first time you look at it. So this visualization is in the book, but I want to draw it out for you using my bad drawing to hopefully allow you to understand what conditional PMF is all about. Okay, so let us draw the joint PMF. Okay, so we have this, this I'm trying to illustrate the joint PMF X, Y. Now, X can take on three values, one, two, and three. And Y can take on, say, for simplicity, only two values, one and two, okay? So the joint PMF is like a matrix. Last time I mentioned that it's a matrix, right? So this is basically here X, here Y, a matrix that is three by two, okay? And the conditional PMF values actually sit on the values of this particular matrix. So let's me use this color. So for example, here I have a large, I have a tall value. And here I have a medium value. And here value here. So all these green stumps, right, must add up to one. Hopefully my drawing makes it clear rather than confuses you. Okay, so the heights of these, six thumbs, right, must add up to one. Oh, my drawing is not bad. Thank you very much. Oh, this makes me feel so good. So the, the sum of all these, sum of the heights of all these thumbs must add up to one, okay? And there are six of them, okay? Now, the, what is the picture that I want you to have in your head? Now, when I am, say, given x equals to one. I am given the event, no, no, maybe let me do y equals to two first, because above we condition on y equals to two. Now, suppose I tell you that, okay, Oliver's height, right, is y equals to two, two units, okay? So now we are actually living, we are actually living in this universe. We are actually living in this new universe. And so what is our belief about x? Well, our belief about x is just looking at these three stumps. Not more. So given y equals to 2, now our PMF of x is the following. PMF of x given y, x given y is equal to 2. Now how many values of x are there? You, there are three values as usual, 1, 2, and 3. And the stumps are actually short, short, long. Short, short, tall. Because I'm only... I'm only, only looking at this slice here. Can you see? I'm only looking at this slice. I'm not looking at the slice y equals to one. I don't care about that because y is equal to two is already told to me. So I'm only looking at this yellow region, this region here. Okay, understand? So we are just focusing our attention there. And then now we have this, scale here, we have, we have this uh, probability mass function here. And here, very importantly, the sum of px given y, x given two over all possible values of x must still be equal to one. So you must renormalize this. And that is the purpose of the denominator here. That is the purpose of the denominator here, to renormalize, to make sure this is a usual, a, a traditional a vanilla PMF. Here, this is a PMF, must be. Okay, now let's do another simple visualization. Okay, I still have time. Okay, now we can actually uh, look in the other direction as well. So I'm running out of colors, but let me use this one. Okay, so suppose now, right, we are given that X is equal to one. Somehow, 
someone told me that in this random experiment, X is equal to one. How does that bias my belief about Y? Where am I living now? All right, I must be living on this slice, right? This is the slice that X is equal to one. I must be living there. And so what the, how does that bias my belief about Y? All right, so now I can draw the probability mass function of Y. Okay, everyone should have corrected me. This should must be X, okay? Typo, major typo, all right? And this is Y here, okay? So how, now someone told me that X is equal to one. How does that change my belief about the P of Y, right? So how many values does Y take on? First and foremost, it takes on two values because now, all right, I'm sitting here. I'm only looking here, focusing all my attention here. Now, why can only take on these two values? You look, you pretend that you only look this way at this slice here. Okay, then one is tall and two is short, right? So we have this situation. One is tall and two is short. So similarly, if you sum up over all possible values of y or p of y given x, y given one, that must be equal to one. So can you see this, this logic here? So you have this joint probability mass function, all right, with a total of six values. Now, when you condition on particular events, you are focusing your attention on particular slices, okay? Then if you focus on a particular slice, you get particular probability mass functions and you must make sure that these add up to one. Now, if you just copy these values here, right? You just copy them, they won't add up to one because these six points add up to one. So these three wouldn't in general, okay? So there's some renormalization you must do here, okay? And similarly, if we restrict ourselves to this slice only, then Y can only take on two values, right? And these two values are one tall and two short here. One tall, two short. Can you see? And this you must renormalize to make sure that these two add up to one. Does everyone understand my picture? Okay, let's see what. So if sum of all joint probabilities per slice must add up to one, do you know what he's trying to say? So if some, this is, this is not a question, David. Uh, this is not a sentence. If sum of all joint probabilities, so the sum of all per slice, right? We're not talking about joint probabilities. We are talking about conditional probabilities. That's number one. This is not a joint probability, it's a conditional. So if you sum over the X for every single slice, Y equals to two, this must add up to one. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay. I don't know whether I satisfy him or not. Uh, anyone has any questions in this room? Uh, David, do you have any questions? Further questions? Xiao Xue? No questions? Okay. Uh, David, feel free to ask me any questions. Okay. Uh, I will try my best to understand and answer. All right, I think this is best illustrated. Uh, let me see. Using an example. Okay, so let me see. So let me try to do an exercise here, an example. I made a typo, are we back? to ask this in later. Okay, you can. So let X be the uh, travel time of a particular message. And Y is the length of the message that we are trying to transmit. So you can imagine that the longer your message, the longer the travel time, all right? So, Say there are only two lengths of messages that you want to send, a long email and a short email. You want to send a short email. So the length of the email is 10 to the two, say only 100 letters. And a long email, while wow, you're really long-winded, you have 10 to the four letters with probability one six. So these are the only two types of messages that you will send, a long message and a short message. And suppose that you send, suppose that Y, 
you want to send a short message. So y is 10 to the 2. All right. Then the length it takes to travel is x equals to 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 1, and x is 10 is 1. Okay. So suppose you are suppose you want to send a short message, then the travel time of the message can take on three values here. Okay. And these have probabilities 1 over 2, 1 over 3, and 1 over 6. So this must add up to 1. You need to check that these add up to 1. Okay. And indeed it does. Okay. Now, but suppose you want to send a long message. So y is 10 to the 4. Okay. Then x equals to 1, x equals to 10 and x equals to 10 to the 2. And these happen with the same probabilities, one, 1 over 2, 1 over 3, 1 over 6. So more succinctly, uh, this is a very long-winded way of writing it, we can write the following, x is equal to 10 to the minus 4y with probability 1 half, 10 to the minus 3y with probability 1 third, and 10 to the minus 2y with probability 1 over 6. These two are equivalent. Let's see why it is true, okay? Now, if y takes on the value 10 to the 2, okay? So we are in this situation here. Then, x is equal to 10 to the minus 4 multiplied by 10 to the 2 is 10 to the minus 2 with probability half. So it co corresponds to this particular row. Now, if y is equal to 10 to the 2, then with probability one third, x takes on the value 10 to the minus three times 10 to the two, which is 10 to the minus one. And we get this row here, okay? But if y is say 10 to the four, okay? Then we are in this particular scenario. And if y is equal to 10 to the four, 10 to the minus four times 10 to the four is exactly equal to one. So we get that x is equal to one with probability half. So this is a more succinct way of writing this two tables here, if you wish, okay? But they are all equivalent. So now let us try to understand what is the probability, okay, of X taking on the value 10 to the two. What is the chance, okay, that the travel time of the message is 10 to the minus two, all right? Now you see here, this question is marginally trickier because there are no numbers. What is the chance that the travel time of the message is 10 to the minus two? Now, if the travel time of the message is so short, then can your message be this long? If your message is this long, the travel time must be at least one. It cannot be 10 to the minus two. The travel time cannot be 10 to the minus two. Okay? So the only way that your travel time can be 10 to the minus two is if your message is short. Okay, so this is nothing but the probability that the message is short, okay, multiplied by the first instance here, okay, 10 to the minus 2 given 10 to the 2, all right, which is this corresponds, this here corresponds to this row here, okay. And actually, this corresponds to the probability that the message is short here. Okay? That is the only way for you to get a very short travel time of 10 to the minus 2. So now it's a matter of plugging numbers in, and we get 5 over 6 times half, which is whatever it is. Okay? Okay. So... Let me now get rid of this and let me do another exercise here. Okay. So now suppose your message, right, is suppose your travel time is 10 to the minus one. Okay. Now you will notice that in order to have this travel time, again, you need a short message. So if you have a long message, you cannot have such a short travel time of 10 to the minus one because the choices here are bigger than one. So here is P of X given Y of 10 to the minus 1 times 10 to the minus, given 10 to the minus 2. And this is 5 over 6 times. Here we have 1 third, which is 5 over 18. All right. 
And I just want to say, just to make this explicit, that this here comes from here. And this here comes from here. All right, the next option is actually not so simple, okay? Now, suppose your travel time is equal to one. This travel time can come about because of two reasons. All right, this travel time can come about because of two reasons. It can come about because the message you send is short or the message you, come, the message you send is long. Because if your message is short, okay, with probability one six, you have the travel time is x equals to one. If your message is long, then your travel time could be very short with a probability half. So there are two options here. So by the law of total probability, this is equal to P of Y short multiplied by P, the travel time being one given the message is short plus P of Y long, P of X given Y, one given long. And so now we can plug in numbers. So this is five over six times um, one over six plus uh, one over six times. Uh, so now we have one half, one half here. All right. And these numbers come about, let me just use a different color. This one comes about from here, one. That's the half. Okay. So this number here, hopefully you understand, comes from the message being short, but we took this route. Okay. And these two are just the prior probabilities of short and long, which is 5616. So after you're all said and done, right, this is one quarter. Okay. Right. So as you can see here, there are different ways of partitioning up the event space. Now, if you want to send, if you receive this, basically your travel time is one, your Y could be from two sources. All right, and we pass this through this particular conditional probability mass function. Does everyone have any questions here? I know there are a lot of numbers. I was also confused. Now, the next two, I will only do one of them, okay? P of X, 10, all right? How can we get 10? Now, if the travel time is so long, right? The message must also be long because here all the travel times are short. So what we have is that the, message is long multiplied by P of X given Y, a long travel time, a long message. So that is nothing but one over uh, six multiplied by uh, one third here. And this one third comes about because of this row here. Okay, right. And this comes about one third here is equal to one over 18. All right, so the last one you do, and uh, the last one is one over 36. And I'm not going to talk about this, but now we have to check that actually all these numbers add up to one. All right, otherwise we have made a mistake somewhere. Okay, so this is the conditional, this is one way of using conditional probabilities. Okay, let me just, uh, this is a very important example. Let me just go through it again. So a priori at the very beginning of time, okay, you only have two messages that you want to send. One is called a long message, and one is called, a, sorry, it's the other way around. I am so not alert now. Long message, okay? So at the very beginning of time, you only want to send two messages, one short and one long. And how short is short? 10 to the, 10 to the two, long is 10 to the four. And you send short messages most of the time. More precisely, five, six of the time you send a short message. And if you send a short message, then the amount of time it takes to travel is 10 to the minus two with this probability, 10 to the minus one with this probability is X equals to one with this probability and so on and so forth. If you send a long message, then the travel time is one, 10 and 10 to the two with these probabilities respectively. Now you can check that these two tables here can be summarized in this form. And WP stands for with probability, okay? And here, what I'm trying to calculate is the marginal distribution on X, marginal probability mass function on X. Now, if your travel time is this short, 10 to the minus two, then your message had got to be short, okay? Because if it is long, you need at least this much travel time. 
So here, your message is short, multiplied by the travel time is short, given the message is short. So you have this. Now, the only complication is if the travel time is moderate. The travel time is moderate, the message could be long or could be short. Okay, this is long, this is short. Right? So if it is short, you must take this route to get to one. If it is long, you must take this route to get to one. So by the law of total probability, you get this number here. Okay, does that make sense? Oh, does it mean? Yes, okay. So for Hadrian, yes. The answer is yes. And Liao Xue, uh, does it mean that in this case, there are only two conditions to choose from one? Yes, exactly. Because Y only has two options. Okay? Yep. So just to summarize, right? Just a summary of everything that we have learned about conditional uh, mass probability mass functions, okay, we have the following. One, if AI, I running from one to N, are events, basically this means A1, A2, all the way up to AN, are events that form a partition of the sample space, and my sample space is omega, then by the law of total probability, we have T of X, X is equal to some I running from one to N of probability of AI, T of X given AI of X. So this is exactly what we used just now, all right? For example, if X is equal to one, okay? How can we possibly partition the sample space? Well, we think of whether the message that we send is long or short, okay? Long or short. So there are only two options that partition the sample space. Then we have this particular distribution here or particular conditional probability mass function. Okay, so this is an instantiation of this one here, these two, okay? Where Py, this one can take on two values. So there are only A1, A2, okay? So this is an instance of the law of total probability or total probability theorem. So as you can see here, this is, a, okay, good. So this is one, this can be expressed in another way, which is as follows, okay? If we have two random variables, X and Y, both are discrete random variables, then the total probability theorem can also be alternatively expressed as P of X, X is equal to sum over all possible values of Y, P, Y of Y, P of X given Y, X given Y. And the reason is because y equals to y can be thought of, can be equivalently thought of as our ai above. So y equals to y forms a partition. So I want to say y equals to y here for all y forms a partition of the sample space. Just as a1, a2, all the way up to an also forms a partition of the sample space. Okay? Right, so basically these are the same thing, right? Because now we just vary the Y here, here we vary the I, they are roughly the same, okay? Right. So today we talked about conditional uh, probability mass functions and conditional uh, probability mass functions given another random variable. So I just want to briefly go through uh, some simple things concerning uh, conditional expectation. And next time we will do an example. Conditional expectation. We know what is expectation, all right? So suppose now I'm given X, a discrete random variable, and A, an event. We always use A to be event and the letters behind to be random variables and say PA is bigger than zero. Then we can talk about the conditional expectation of X. We can talk about conditional expectation of X given the event A. All right, what, does, what is the meaning of this? Well, this is the, given this notation, expectation value of X given event A, which is nothing but a sum over all possible values of X, X, P, X given A, X. This is the conditional probability mass function that we derived just now. So now, 
The only difference relative to, con relative to expectation is that we have this conditioning here and there's a conditioning here. The formula remains the same, okay? Except that now we are averaging with respect to this particular probability mass function, which is a conditional PMF, okay? So this is a very natural thing. In, because we condition on A here, we use the conditional PMF here, all right? So this is conditional expectation of a random variable given an event. We can also talk about the conditional expectation of a particular random variable X given another random variable Y, okay? Given that, let me see, given um, that, another random variable y takes on the value little y. Well, that is denoted as expectation value of x given y is equal to y. Because this is a, what is this? This is a, this is exactly an event A. You can think of it that way. So the formula for this is nothing but expectation value over x, multi, x, p of x given y, x given y. Because the y equals to y represents the event A here. Okay, so that is the definition of the conditional expectation of x, given that another random variable takes on the value y. Okay, we can also talk about the analog of the law of total probability or total probability theorem. This is called the total expectation theorem, if you wish. These two are called the total expectation theorems. So again, we have A1, A2, and so on. They are events, they are disjoint events that form a partition of the sample space. Sample space is always omega. And each of the PAIs is positive. Then we can write the expectation value of X as the sum over P of AI P of AI, expectation value of X given the event AI. So this is a very useful formula because this tells this actually gives us a suggestion of how we can compute the expectation value of X. Now, if we can compute the expectation value of X given additional knowledge about some particular event, then we can use a divide and conquer approach to compute the overall expectation. And we will see some examples of this at the start of next lecture where I have more time. So this is called the total expectation theorem and we can show this, all right? And I'll show it to you at the very end here. Now, finally, we can also do the following. Since the events y equals to y for all y, this is four, form a partition of the sample space. We can also write the expectation value of X as the sum over all possible values of Y, P of Y, Y, expectation value of X given Y is equal to Y, right? These two are completely analogous because this is completely analogous to this probability here because this is nothing but the probability that Y is equal to Y. And this part here, is completely analogous to this part here because I'm always talking about the expectation value of a random variable given an event, okay? So actually we can very easily verify this formula here. And we can do so because we believe the total probability theorem. So let us try to verify star, okay? So what we have is the following. We start from the total probability theorem. Okay. We start from the total probability theorem, which tells us that uh, P of X, X is equal to the sum up to N of probability of AI, P of X given AI, X. So that is the total probability theorem. This one here comes from um, here. Right? This comes from here, total probability theorem. We are splitting up into different events that form a partition of the sample space. Remember the sample space looks like this. So we partition it up, we divide it up into a few parts. 
a three, a four, a five. These are all disjoint as you can see, but they, upon taking their union, you get the entire sample space. Okay, so that's what you call partition of the sample space. Okay, so this comes exactly from the total probability theorem. Now we do magic on this. How, what magic do we do? We multiply by X on both sides. Okay, we basically multiply by X on both sides. X here, X, P, X of X. All right, this is the same as this. Then we sum over X. So we have a sum over all X, X, P, X of X. This is nothing but sum over all X of here. All right. So now what we have is that the left-hand side, this is equal to the expectation value of X by definition. But the right-hand side here, we can massage this a little. We can bring out the sum over I. We can swap the sums. This has got nothing to do with X, so it can be brought outside. And here is sum over X, X, P, X given A, I of X. But this is nothing but the sum over I running from one to N of P of A, I, the expectation value of X given A, I. All right? So these, th these two are also equal. So as you can see here, all we have done is we have started from the regular total probability theorem, which is this. Okay, and we have multiplied both sides by X and we have summed over all values of X. On the left-hand side, if you sum over all values of X, you get the, X, the regular expectation. You sum over all values of X here, you get this. Then you swap the sums here. You swap here, you are allowed to do that. Okay, and then the PAI comes outside. But this part here is exactly equal to this part here, which is the conditional expectation of X given event AI. Okay, so this one here all sounds a little bit abstract. Next time we will look at more examples and we'll wrap up this chapter. So today I'm only talking about conditional expectation. Next time we will make everything much more concrete because this class is a bit asymmetric uh, because I have a short lecture and I have a long lecture. So I have to design the material properly. So here I'm going to talk about theory most of the time, but next time I'll do more calculations. Okay, that will make everything more, more, much more concrete. All right, thank you very much. And um, I'll see you at tutorial, at least those in my tutorial. Have a good day. Bye-bye.